Educar para la vida es amar el mundo, las otras especies y a la naturaleza. Es dejar el mundo en las mejores manos. Magnus Havelsrud is a Norwegian educator, researcher, and professor emeritus at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. His work deals with the critic of the reproductive of the reproductive role of education and the possibilities for transcendence of this reproduction in light of the tradition of educational sociology and peace research. He served as the guest professor of the German Council for Peace and Conflict Research, worked at the Institute for War Order in New York and the University of Tromsø. He is also co-founder with Betty Reardon of the Global Campaign on Peace Education. Okay, Magnus, I don't know if you want to add something to this uh, short biography or we can start with the uh, uh, proposal. No, I think you can hear. Ah, no, no, I can hear, yeah. No, I, I asked you a question, Madam. Um, uh, how, how many participants are listening in on this meeting? Okay. Do you know that or not? No, I wasn't. Well, if not, then we, we don't spend the time in finding out. <laughs> okay, so we, we are just meeting this by uh, YouTube, but I can see now uh, the platform. So. Yeah, well, let me begin then. Um, when this is a very broad topic, isn't it? Criticism of the reproductive role of education. <clears throat> so I'm going to focus on, <clears throat> on a specific part of this topic, and that is how transnational educational policymaking <clears throat> is influencing the evaluation of knowledge. <clears throat> external forces to education are not always easily detectable in everyday life. In a forthcoming doctoral thesis here in Norway, Holdenach analyzes the development of transnational educational policymaking in the organization. And now we can go to slide two for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. After the Second World War, OECD preferences, um, OECD preferences in transnational policy making in education is now rooted in neoliberal ideology. Hovdenak shows that OECD as a head leading agent in the transnationalization of policy making in education, shifted from Keynesian economics in the planning of economic and social development to the neoliberalist, neoliberalist Hayek inspired flexibility paradigm required by free markets that are to a large extent beyond regulation. This market-driven system found strong political basis in the Reagan and Thatcher governments in the 80s. This ideology questions the very concept of planning in that anything that might be thought to be an obstacle to the development and or maintenance of free markets is not given priority in the planning of future society. Consequently, educational policymaking has to be sensitive to where the market goes, implying that a flexible workforce must be ready to follow wherever the market dictates. Also, in learning skills demanded by the market, 
at any time and place. Market preferences influence movements of labor, capital and competence. An epistemology of competence and skills demanded by a market dynamism that cannot easily be either regulated or planned now finds its expression in the everyday life of formal education. <clears throat> Could you go to slide two? <clears throat> sure. And uh, in this slide too, uh, I have um, I have um, quoted. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, you go a little bit too fast. Fast mm -hmm. uh, slide two. I quoted um, what is on the OECD website. PISA is the OECD's program for international student assessment. PISA measures fifteen-year-olds' ability to use their reading, mathematics, and science knowledge and skills to meet the real life challenges. Slide three. In uh, The Guardian on uh, May 6, 2014, you can Google this article. I have taken out some extracts from this article because it is an article a letter written to OECD and the head of the PISA evaluations by more than 80 scholars and educationists around the world. Quote, I, we shall go fast through this text. By emphasizing a narrow range of measurable aspects of education, PISA takes attention away from the less measurable and immeasurable educational objectives like physical, moral, civic, and artistic development, <clears throat> thereby dangerously narrowing our collective imagination regarding what education is and ought to be about. Then slide three, no, four, I'm sorry. OECD is biased, they write in favor of the economic role of public schools. But preparing young men and women for gainful employment is not the only and not even the main goal of public education, which has to prepare students for participation in democratic self-government, moral action, and the life of personal development, growth, and well-being. Slide five. They <clears throat> write that there is a continuous cycle of global testing by OECD. It harms our children and impoverishes our classrooms as it inevitably involves more and longer batteries of multiple choice testing, more scripted vendor made lessons and less autonomy for teachers. And then slide six. Comparing developing countries where 15 year olds are regularly drafted into child labor with first world countries makes neither educational nor political sense and opens OECD up for charges of educational colonialism. Slide seven. No reform of any consequence should be based on a single narrow measure of quality. And this sentence is taken in there because OECD bases its educational reform advice to national governments on the data from these evaluations. A slide eight. Groups with greatest influence on what and how and in international learning is assessed are psychometricians, statisticians, and economists. They certainly deserve a seat at the table, but so do many other groups, parents, educators, administrators, community leaders, students, as well as scholars from disciplines 
like anthropology, sociology, history, philosophy, linguistics, as well as the arts and humanities. Slide nine. OECD's narrow focus on standardized testing, we have slide nine, Marian. <clears throat> Hello. Can you hear me? Um, slide nine. <clears throat> the, the, it starts with OECD. Please wait. Focus. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, narrow focus on standardized testing risks turning learning into drudgery and killing the joy of learning. As PISA has led many governments into an international competition for higher test scores, OECD has assumed the power to shape the education policy around the world with no debate about the necessity or limitations of OECD goals. Slide 10, we are deeply concerned that measuring a great diversity of educational traditions and cultures using a single narrow biased yardstick could in the end do irreparable harm to our schools and our students. <clears throat> Slide 11. Personally, I have reviewed some of the research. We are now finished with the letters uh, to the OECD by the 80 scholars and educationists. And I sum up three points that I have found when I have studied the research and criticism of the PISA evaluations in more than 80 countries around the world. <clears throat> These evaluations, they do not relate that to the fact that the curriculum in each country is, uh, is different from each other. It's not a common curriculum in all over the world. It, it, it varies in, in every country. And secondly, the evaluation has a reductionist view of knowledge as it is mainly cognitive. And thirdly, the life word or context of the learner is of no relevance in their um, <clears throat> questions. <clears throat> because the questions are designed to be used in all the countries. Uh, Bernstein, the, the next uh, slide is number 12. <clears throat> Basil Bernstein is um, an important sociologist of education um, who's passed away now, but uh, he worked at the University of London and uh, he wrote um, one thing that I think we should remind ourselves when it comes to how we evaluate knowledge. He points out, slide 12, I quote, once knowledge is separated from the inwardness, from commitments, from personal dedication, from the deep structure of the self, then people may be moved about, substituted for each other, and excluded from the market. And it goes on to say that this separation or dislocation of knowledge from the knower is in harmony with the market principles of a new right. Let us add neoliberal ideology. <clears throat> um, slide 13. I have um, put in a diagram <clears throat> three main uh, pillars that I think we need to relate to when we discuss education. Content, form, and the contextual conditions and the relations among these three. Arrow number one 
in the figure shows their methods or communication forms preferred will influence the selection of content. Arrow number two shows that the definition of what constitutes valid knowledge will influence the selection of communication forms. Recognizing this interrelationship between content and form implies that they cannot be viewed in isolation from each other, but needs to be developed in mutual support. <clears throat> Just like the interrelation between content and form, there is an interrelation between form and contextual conditions. Con the numbers three and four in the diagram. <clears throat> contextual conditions refer not only to cultural, economic, social, and political characteristics of a society and the world, but the specific characteristics of the local community, including all the different educators important in the life of the learner, including parents, siblings, friends, media, <clears throat> and of course, the school. Lastly, figure one, uh, this figure depicts an interrelationship between content and contextual conditions, five and six. The content of education can be restricted to past and present realities and show little interest in future potential reality. In this case, the content of education is geared towards preserving reality as it is, and thereby maintaining both strengths and weaknesses in that reality. The function of the content is then to preserve contextual conditions, and this would be an example of arrow five in the figure. In the case of problem-connected, problem-centered development of content, the search for causes of the existence of a problem would become a step in the direction of finding out how to eradicate the problem and therefore and thereby help transform problematic contextual conditions. And this is illustrated by arrow six, meaning transformative education, isn't it? Number six. <clears throat> Let's go to um, <clears throat> the 14. Um, my good friend, Basil Bernstein, he once pointed out that the legitimate text in the school is defined as any realization on the part of the pupil which attracts evaluation. <clears throat> this is. Um, what is, what, what is regarded as valid content in, in, this, in education is therefore that which attracts evaluation. This is at the center of the PISA evaluation that they have reduced, they have developed an evaluation which we, we I, I argued is based on a reduced understanding <clears throat> of knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> Bernstein also wrote this text, the legitimate text, in other words, the text that is required in the evaluation at school, is the product of dominant forces in society. Let's go to 15. Slide 15. Uh, in this um, figure, which I have produced at one point, you see uh, two axes. The space axis is horizontal, or it turns down, <laughs> towards the right downwards in a way. And the time axis is vertical. Their crossing point illustrates the here and now context of each individual. 
this context is constantly changing in as time progresses and the situations outside the here and now develop. The figure thus puts each individual in the center of time and space. Time can be visualized in terms of the past, the present, and the future. The past is indefinite, and so is the future. The present may be defined in terms of measurable time, such as seconds, hours, days, weeks, or months. The limits of the present may be drawn by individuals in reference to events such as change of location, moving from home to school, change of activity, getting up in the morning, means to change one's behavior from sleeping to eating breakfast, or change of social context, guest arrives or leaves. The present may also be a moment of kairos, in which only a few moments may seem like an eternity, for instance, waiting to get out of a cat catastrophic situation or moment of deep love. Departing from such <clears throat> now contexts, the time axis stretches towards the past as well as the future. Um, time. Sí, amigos, si solo la... So the, no we can talk porque... about uh, the close and intermediate and distant time from the individual. Now you see two arrows along the time axis. And those two arrows illustrate the causality over time. The arrow pointing upwards illustrates the context at one time will influence the context at a later time. The arrow pointing downwards illustrates the idea behind the self-fulfilling prophecy, expectations, aspirations, hopes, and visions of the future influence human behavior at earlier time points. The extreme left is the position of the individual <clears throat> and the arrow to the right signifies indefinite space in physical terms. Now, as human life is limited to our planet, with only a few uh, exceptions, as we know, the crossing point of the outer circle and the space axis points out the physical limits of global society. Thus, this point represents planet Earth in physical terms and the social, cultural, economic, <clears throat> and political characteristics of global human society. <clears throat> the arrow pointing, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the arrow pointing to the left along the space axis illustrates the influence of society upon individuals living in it. The arrow pointing to the right along the space axis illustrates the fact that society is a human product. Thus, the figure points out that there is a dialectical relationship between world society and each individual. Each individual is involved in an everyday context which has linkages <clears throat> to contexts that are outside this context. Outside contexts have been called intermediate and distant realities in this model. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let me um, go to slide uh, 16. <clears throat> this one? Uh, yeah, that's the one, exactly. <clears throat> Contextual conditions is therefore not only micro, the closed reality, it is also different reality. It is intermediate reality, and it is the history of our life and our humanity 
and it is the potential reality of the future. And all those matters, the complexity of contextual conditions is enormous. Contextual conditions relate to micro as well as macro realities. And such realities can be described in terms of social, political, cultural, and economic aspects, and how these relate to each other on different levels, local, national, global. Understanding contextual conditions, therefore, involves nothing less than understanding both micros and macros and how they relate to each other. This means to develop an understanding of the relationships between close and distant realities in terms of time and space. <clears throat> uh, this is what I have said here, really, is a note on the question of content and contextual conditions. Let's go to slide 17, which, which is a <clears throat> um, uh, topic uh, of, of the form. As you remember, I had written content form, contextual conditions. And let's talk a little bit about this, <clears throat> this figure in terms of how form is of great importance <clears throat> in, in uh, the question of um, if you are going to criticize <clears throat> um, the reproductive role of education. This, what I have written here, is very much inspired by conscientization approach of Paulo Freire. <clears throat> then number one signifies the first phase of the dialogical process. In this phase, the initial meeting of the group and its teacher, facilitator, coordinator takes place <clears throat> in order to select what Freire called the generative themes of the context for continued content development. <clears throat> the discussion about a generative theme constitutes the materials to be used in the codification that the teacher should be doing, facilitator, from one to two. The codification represents a bridge between the concrete and the abstract. In the decodification, going from two to three, the more abstract description of the practice or the initial understanding of the practice is tested in reference to the part of the empirical reality which the generative theme is all about and which is known to the participants because the participants, they live it. It is their life world. At this stage, the theory may be changed. They may say, this is not correct. It has to be a different way of understanding this reality. Some subjective perceptions may be approved and others refused. So after a new phase of codification from three to four, new decodifications follow from four to five so codification, decodification processes continue, reflection and action, changing of the theory and changing of the reality go hand in hand. And we have praxis, a concept of knowledge, <clears throat> which is called praxis, which means that it is not only cognitions, it is actions reflection and action. So this is a, this is a note on the question of, uh, of form and how the OECD PISA <clears throat> evaluations 
have totally disregarded the variations in different kinds of communication forms because the curriculum is of no relevance in their <clears throat> evaluations. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if we are going to criticize, criticize um, <clears throat> the, the productive role of education, I believe we need to specify from which criteria uh, are we going to <clears throat> are we going to use in order to criticize <clears throat> the reproduction? I, that's why I in this talk I first um, by the, with the help of uh, of the more than eighty scholars and educationists who wrote a letter to the PISA evaluators in Paris <clears throat> first by Quoting some of their some of their um, criticisms of the evaluations of the, the that legitimate text that this transnational project has decided should be the legitimate text for fifteen year olds in more than eighty countries uh, in science reading and mathematics. Every three years, new, new questions come, come out. Same questions to every country, independent of what kind of life world the students might have lived and in what conditions they are and what kind of problems there are in their societies. <clears throat> so, let me go to to number 19. I think we have to jump over 18 because of time. <clears throat> um, this, <clears throat> this slide which you just <laughs> showed, Mariam. Um, uh, could you show it again? Number 19, slide number 19. Uh, I have to show, yeah, we, we jump over this one here because yeah, we go to 19. Yeah, <clears throat> I have already shown part of this um, text um, as, as a slide before. What I have not shown is in, um, in the, the, the black um, <clears throat> text at the bottom. But let me remind you of the whole thing that contextual conditions <clears throat> relate to micro as well as macro realities. Such realities can be described in terms of social, political, cultural, and economic aspects, and how these relate to each other. Understanding contextual conditions, therefore, involves nothing less <clears throat> than understanding both micros and macros and their relations. <clears throat> this means to develop an understanding of the relationships between close and distant realities and how different forms of violence <clears throat> interact. I have written the three main forms of violence that has been explained in his research, direct physical violence, structural violence, and cultural violence. We can talk about that maybe in the <clears throat> discussion. To develop a conception of this complexity is a requirement for finding out how to act in making peace and reducing violence in one's society. <clears throat> in um, the next slide, I have um, written up a couple of references which I have used when I gave, decided on what to say in this talk. Uh, so maybe you can show that slide number 20. And um, I think, um, Mariam, what is the time now? Should we move over okay. to questions? Uh, have 10 minutes, I think, for questions. So we can start. OK. So, so uh, first of all, thank you, Magnus. Uh, 
And the first question is, how to introduce the diversity of ways to educate in an education that only has academic parameters of validation? And I think that um, this question is also direct to know how, how can we work from the local and the global perspective, which corresponds to these close and distant realities or the micro and macro space, mm -hmm. uh, which corresponds uh, to make the educational space more open to the diversity uh, that is characteristic of knowledge. <clears throat> yes, I, um, <clears throat> uh, the, to, to go back to my three main headings, form, uh, content form and contextual conditions. I, I think um, that uh, how we can approach this uh, is through <clears throat> is through dialogue, um, as I try to show in the picture of the, the big arrow towards the praxis. <clears throat> and um, the reason why I think that the form is so important, the dialogical form is so important in countering Reproduction, reproductive role of education is that <clears throat> it is the way that human beings can bring themselves into the classroom through their commitments, their inner thoughts and feelings, their problems in life, in other words, <clears throat> the life world becomes um, a departing point, <laughs> the micro, so to speak. <clears throat> it is difficult for me to, <clears throat> to uh, think that it is possible to start with global education by forgetting this micro. That's why the relationship between micro and macro is become so important, because of that uh, that the bridge between <clears throat> the individual and the world, the life world of the individual, is a must. If we lose hold of that, uh, <clears throat> then I think we may go in the direction of of uh, reproducing the world, the macros as they are today, without making it possible for the learner to become an actor in transforming problematic contextual conditions. Of course. And I actually find it very important um, what we talk today about the problem around the academic validation system uh, that leave out the great diversity of educational traditions and cultures who are, who are forced to adapt to a unique and exclusive way, uh, way of, of evaluation. And well, Magnus, uh, we want to express our gratitude for accepting this invitation to participate in the World Meeting AOK for Life. And it was really a fortune to have you today. Pardon? With us. You can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So I, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Did you, you did you have one more question, Mariam? I didn't understand. Uh, I don't think so, no. No. Let me see the chat. No, I don't think so. I think that's... Okay. Thank that's you for so listening to me for so long. No, thank you to you for accepting this invitation. Thank it you. was a pleasure to me. Okay. We hope, we hope to meet you again in okay. another Bye. opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye, Magnus. Thank you. Bye -bye.